welcome to the Center for Global Ethnography. I'm Sharika Tiranagam, I'm one of the co-directors of the Center. And in this video, I'm talking to Dr. Urus Braverman, William J. McGovern Faculty Scholar, Professor of Law and Adjunct Professor of Geography at the University of Buffalo School for Law, the State University of New York. In this wide-ranging um, interview, Dr. Braverman talks about her research, both with um, scientists and also with uh, of various kinds, from veterinarians to coral scientists, her work with um, uh, um, professionals also in Gaza, in a, a variety of settings. She talks about using different kinds of digital methods and gives advice to um, students facing the current moment on how to best prepare oneself and to also think about how to do non-contact research in ethical and comprehensive ways. So hi everybody, thank you for joining me today. My name is Irus Braverman and I am a professor of law at the University at Buffalo, the State University of New York. Um, I'm originally from Jerusalem, I was born there, uh, left uh, about 15 years ago and um, my work is, is, is ethnographic uh, at its core, so I've been doing what some people call legal ethnography. Well, some people say uh, it's not ethnography at all, but uh, you know, we, can, we can discuss that perhaps. Um, and my work started in the context of Jerusalem with, um, with uh, intense work with the with zoning bureaucrats actually and uh, the questions around illegal uh, or so-called illegal planning in East Jerusalem by Palestinians uh, then shifted to working on trees and the war over land through uh, the acts of planting and uprooting pine trees and olive trees in Israel and Palestine. I shifted then to uh, working on zoos and the management of animals within the zoo context and then beyond. And my latest monograph was uh, Coral Whispers, came out in uh, November 2018, where I interviewed uh, some 100 marine scientists on the plight of corals in the Anthropocene. Could you tell us a little bit about how you've used um, digital methods to carry out your ethnographic research? Because I understand that, especially in the terms of the coral whisperers, some of it was also non-contact as well. So if you could tell us both about digital methods and non-contact methods that you've used, and mm -hmm. you know, how you feel that they have shaped your research and its findings. Yeah. So I guess, um, my work has always involved um, contact and non-contact interviews, and I use non-contact interviews for a variety of purposes. So in some instances, it was in preparation for the contact interviews, and because I, uh, I don't usually reside near uh, where, um, where my uh, interviewees are, I usually reach out to them. And so before I travel somewhere or before I go somewhere, there's usually some preparatory uh, practice of reaching out, discussing, seeing whom they would recommend to go to. If I do field work in Israel, Palestine, and I'm going only for a month or two uh, for the summer, for example, then it's easier for me to prepare that so that I don't go there and then waste time, uh, precious time of being there in just trying to make uh, networking and, con and, and contact. So I feel like the non-contact aspect of my work uh, usually has been that kind of preliminary reaching out, even doing preliminary interviews, getting the people to know me, to talk to me. I usually prefer to do that over Skype. Basically, it allows you to see the person and and have that kind of sense of intimacy that perhaps the phone wouldn't. However, certain people don't feel comfortable actually putting their videos on, so uh, I, would, I would then talk to them on the phone or on WhatsApp or on whatever method they feel comfortable with. So that's one way of using non-contact um, non interviews is in preparation or even 
uh, after you've already made the contact. So if you already have contact people, people who you've established, established trust with, who know you, um, then following up, follow up interviews are much easier to do this way, especially if, if you don't have the means to travel or if you can't travel. So for example, for Coral Whisperers, um, so one of my central interviewees, uh, her name is, or was, she actually died, unfortunately, um, Ruth Gates. And let me think, I met her first in a conference and uh, we had this click, it was good energy, and she invited me over to Hawaii to her marine science lab. And I ended up going there because I was um, also doing other things in Hawaii, attending a conference, so it was fine. And I spent a whole day with her at her lab and just walking around and talking and observing and observing her relationships and looking in the microscope on corals and I even uh, scuba, di uh, scuba dived with her that day. S and, um, and then after that though, for t two years, I believe, I believe it was, we were in, in contact. This is uh, non-contact contact, right? So emails, Skype, and in fact, we established a really strong relationship over these mediums. So, so I will say um, this was very helpful. We had follow-up interviews on Skype, maybe three or four. She went over the text that I wrote, the, even the, the, the transcripts of the interviews, and we had, we had a very collaborative uh, uh, and immersive kind of relationship. And so these in-depth interviews became, um, I, I, I might want to pause to say that Coral Whispers is kind of a strange book in that it's built on regular chapters, but in between the chapters, uh, there are large chunks of interviews and actually uh, in edited interviews. And so each one of the interviewees, these are central scientists in the coral field, and uh, they've each dealt with an aspect that, I, that was interesting to me. And so for example, with Ruth, uh, her interview uh, basically seals the book. And, um, and so I allowed the interviewees to, take, to look through the interviews and we had discussions because maybe I didn't understand exactly what they meant and they felt like, okay, this point needs to be made better. And so then um, there was a, um, basically the text was a springboard for further collaboration and further uh, interviews over Skype and over email and over the text. So I wanna say as ethnographers, we have a, a, a range of tools that are available to us, right? Uh, the same as we do as humans, right? Like if we can't see our parents or we can't see our friends. It's not like necessarily that, that we're not talking to them anymore, but we find a way to communicate with them a little bit differently now. And so, um, and so this is what I would kind of uh, encourage you to explore. Which contacts that you already have, can you continue to communicate with uh, through these digital means uh, that we have now? Uh, maybe reaching out to new people and seeing whether you can establish trust through other means. For example, reading their work in advance and knowing if they're professional, uh, if you're talking to them about their professional work, right? Uh, if they're scientists or bureaucrats, uh, knowing who they are, doing a lot of uh, preparatory work so that when you're coming into the meeting with them, they feel like you know uh, already what you're asking, et cetera, et cetera. So I do wanna say this about also Skype meetings and, and, uh, and telephone interviews, is that I prepare a lot for them. I don't just come and like tabula rasa kind of sit and, I, I, I have a list of questions, and of course, it, uh, not of course, but my, my interviews are usually semi-structured. So I have the questions, but then I can let go of them and follow the path of what the, where the person wants to lead me. So I've got that kind of freedom. But I do prepare, I do learn a lot about that person. If I have people who I've contacted and who know me in person, and that person knows them, and that's quite important to stress that kind of connection because contacts are still, physical contacts are still important in our world, right? The person, you establish that you know somebody that they know or that you have read something that they wrote about or like, um, I think that's, that's really important for establishing trust. 
So, oh. um, can I ask you another question about that, Louis? Because I think it's really interesting that you've also done work in Gaza. So, in that sense, how do you find um, digital and also non-contact methods working in highly politically charged or, um, you know, very contested um, uh, areas or in, in terms of fieldwork and that are politically sensitive? I know many students actually also worry about, like, how do I keep these materials safe? How do I do interviews with, with people on very politically sensitive um, matters? And do you think that there are, I mean, could you tell us a little bit both about the opportunities and also some of the constraints? Yeah. Okay, so Gaza is a different story because Gaza has been under siege uh, since 2006, more or less. And uh, as a, is an Israeli or former Israeli ethnographer, um, and actually, as many Westerners cannot enter Gaza at all. So in fact, when I decided to work on Gaza, uh, it was clear that this is not gonna be a contact kind of work. It was just impossible. Now, my point of entry into Gaza was that I was trying to examine captivity, right? Captivity was an interesting question for me. What constitutes captivity and um, usually, because of my work on zoos, I've been working on animals in captivity. So I was interested in the interconnections between human animal captivity in Gaza, right? So as Noam Chomsky famously said about Gaza, Gaza is the largest prison, uh, open air prison in the world. And, um, and I was interested in that, it seemed to me that the zoo animals in Gaza have more freedom than the Palestinian humans living in, in Gaza. Uh, for example, if there's a zoo animal uh, who is sick, uh, case, uh, the case that I discussed with some lion, the, the, then Israel would allow it in, whereas a Palestinian who's sick, uh, in most cases, would have a much harder time. And so I was interested in the, re in the uh, dehumanization of humans in Gaza and in the um, or animalization of humans in Gaza and of the um, humanization of the animals uh, and and so I wanted to talk to zoo directors uh, I, I found the founder of the Gaza Zoo and we began a relationship over Skype uh, we would interview, sometimes I would hear the bombing, uh, because this was in 2014 when I uh, decided to work on Gaza. I was uh, outraged by the uh, bombing the, of, of Israel over, over Gaza um, during the summer of 2014, and I wanted to write something about it. There was no way I was going to get in there. And so I worked with Dr. Shawa, who was vet and the director uh, the founder and the director of the Gaza Zoo, and we were documenting basically what was happening, how many of his chicken were killed in the bombings, uh, how many of the zoo animals, how they managed to feed them or not feed them, how they feel not being able to access their animals, um, how they feel in comparison to their animals, the fact that the animals can get away, but they can't. Um, so those were questions that were interesting to me. And Dr. Shawa and I were in touch for a few years, and that was the basis for um, for an article that came out finally, I think, in Cultural Critique. So uh, just to say, in Gaza, there was really no other choice. So, the, so I never met Dr. Shawa in person, and I probably will never be able to meet him, uh, unfortunately. Um, and so like, uh, actually, interestingly, when COVID, uh, um, the COVID outbreak started, the, the Gazans were saying, well, finally, the world can understand our situation. Finally, everybody is in our situation. Everybody is under quarantine and they can't move around, et cetera, et cetera. And so I've been attending Zoom conferences from Gaza with, med with me medical professionals and, and uh, social workers discussing it. In fact, it feels almost like Gaza is more open now because of this ability of people to 
and their willingness to be sitting in front of screens and communicating that way. So I, um, so there are some opportunities around that, connecting with groups. Uh, people are more willing to be connecting through screens now than they probably would have. Uh, I've got a project going on in Israel-Palestine now around uh, the management of national parks and nature reserves. This is something I've been working on for many years, and every time I go, I, I, it's been probably already a decade that I'm going back and forth around this project. And I'm just on the verge of finishing it. I just needed one more visit. And I was very upset to find out that, that uh, now I can't go. Um, and so I'm actually wondering what to do about it. And now some cultures are, people will not necessarily trust you um, over Zoom. They need to get to know you. They need to be in the same space with you. Uh, in those instances, I, I think that, uh, that one might want to consider changing the course of their field work. Um, and this is what I'm considering doing because a lot of the people that I'm gonna interview, uh, these are very contentious political questions for them and they will probably uh, talk to me only once they see me and, ha and kind of see my body language and communicate with me in that way. Um, and it would be too formal for them to do it um, being recorded over Skype like, like this um, uh, for a lot of them. So in that sense, I think I'm going to have to rethink some of the project. So I'm not saying that you can just shift uh, from, from doing contact to non-contact. I think uh, it needs to be very thoughtful. One needs to think which, which projects it would work for and which projects or for which uh, subjects or interviewees, whatever we want to call them, it, it won't work. And then maybe find a way around it. So, um, so yeah, my Israel-Palestine project involves a lot of um, a lot of observations being out in the field with the uh, national parks inspectors with the administrators and things uh, that come up in the field these are people who are outside outdoors all the time they they don't like sitting in front of computers they don't necessarily have even like access to these things um, I was going to interview Bedouins uh, in in villages and um, and so I would be living with them. In that sense, it would this would be very hard to do in this time. I'm thinking mm, maybe I'll refocus that project for now and shift to do more interviews uh, in other in other fields that I've been working on. For example, on marine genetic resources and deep sea uh, conservation management. A lot of scientists that I interview are already are working now online and doing this kind of remote uh, stuff. A lot of the conferences that I would be attending are now actually more accessible because you don't have to fly um, and you could some, somehow get on board. So conferences, workshops, meetings that are already on Zoom, if you could get into them and observe them, uh, you know, convince people that that it's in their best interest to let you in, that you're gonna contribute, that um, I think those are the opportunities that we have now. But then there are the pitfalls of, right, we cannot communicate with people uh, with body language and in this kind of um, more intimate uh, bodily presence that, that we're more accustomed to in a lot of our field work. So another opportunity that um, that I thought I would raise here is uh, is actually COVID uh, and what it does in various uh, envir various environments. So I don't know if uh, your work has something to do with it, but it would be interesting to explore what's happening now in the present moment. So for example, I just finished a book on zoo veterinarians, and the book. Um, while I was doing the last interviews for the book, which were on Skype actually, because the interviews uh, were 
far away and I didn't want to travel to Australia for one interview. So this um, one interviewee is the, is the chief zoo vet in the Taronga Zoo in Sydney. And I wanted to interview him in particular because they were just experiencing these fires and I wanted to find out how he was dealing with this massive death of, um, of, uh, uh, of wildlife there and what he was doing. It was interesting to talk to him uh, about the fires as they were happening in Australia. And then COVID started and I was talking to vets and uh, my last interview was with this woman who works in the St. Louis Zoo. Um, and she was talking to me about the human animal interaction and the fact that, that it's so interconnected, human, human uh, health, animal health and ecosystem health. And uh, vets are calling it uh, One Health, the One Health approach. And COVID has become a really important realization of the One Health approach. So as we were talking, this was January, just the beginning of everything. Some of the vets I was interviewing were actually on the front lines, of, turned to be on the front lines of COVID. And uh, because of their expertise on epidemiology, some of them are also epidemiologists. So you know, this whole thing, wet markets, uh, wildlife trafficking, these all these questions about uh, about problems that we see with wildlife, uh, crises that we see with, uh, uh, with ecosystems and biodiversity, and how are they connected with the, crisis, with the health crisis became something that was really important uh, for me to include in the book. That, in fact, turned out to be the conclusion of the book, something I didn't expect. The fact that I was able to do these interviews around the world without having to travel, without having to prepare, that I was flexible to do that, and that went into the conclusion to the book that I just finished. Um, and, and so, so that was, it was helpful that I, that I was open to change the course of the book and to include the One Health approach. And in fact, it kind of changed the whole concept of the, the book because then I went back and revisited the introduction and some other places in the book because One Health became something that I really was invested in promoting and also questioning what was the problem and how vets are thinking about One Health. So, so that became really the highlight of the book, I think, and how relevant it's become because I was able to pick up and do these kind of digi digital recordings. And in fact, the interview I did with, with, um, with Sharon Deem about this vet um, from St. Louis um, about One Health, I told her, listen, uh, do you mind if I'm just going to record it? Uh, and she's like, ah, but I'm not really dressed for recording. But then she's like, okay, record it. And, I, and then I ended up asking her for permission and I showed it to my students. I teach climate change and uh, it was really important for, for my class as well. So the problem of not being able to meet in person actually came, became an opportunity to communicate her message to a broader audience through the video. So we're using a different type of media now and suddenly I'm thinking, huh, now that I'm recording in these kind of controlled environments, maybe I could patch it up and make it something a little bit different, a more media oriented kind of ethnography that I can share with others if my interviewees are willing to do that. Thank you so much. And I, I just, I guess I have one final question I want to ask. Um, Ansa, you were talking about how the actual, the medium itself shapes some of what you um, end up finding or, you know, it's not just an indifferent medium, the digital medium, but it provides certain kinds of possibilities. So I had one um, other question, which is, do you think there are any, there's, is there anything that graduate students right now can do or some kind of skills they could acquire in order to to you know sort of enhance how they do digital research or non-contact research or use digital methods i mean is it just a case of like trial and error just try it out and see it or do you think there are any things that they could do to better prepare for how to use these sorts of methods i mean even just getting trained if, if there's some kind of training they could what you do? Right. Well, what have you found in your experience in doing this that you wish you had perhaps known or had um, been able to do ahead of time? Well, um, I will say we are trained, all of us now, because of the situation, to use these technologies. 
a lot of us, uh, this is how we're communicating with our loved ones and with people back home or, um, so in that, um, in that sense, it's very, the technologies that I've been using have been very basic. I've been using Skype, telephone, uh, when I, when I use phone calls, because some people don't feel like being exposed to video, I ask them for permission to record. Um, I make it very clear. I record their permission. And, um, and so, and, and so because, because you do need to think about the ethics also of doing ethnography in this way, right? So, uh, since you're not in the same room and they can't see that you're recording necessarily, of course, you've got to consider that. And even though sometimes I feel like they'd be much more open perhaps to discussing certain things without my recorder being obvious and without me telling them, now I'm starting to record and whatever you don't want to be on record, you need to tell me. Um, and so, <clears throat> so you guys, I think probably your students are already trained to think about these questions and have to go through IRB, et cetera, et cetera, for a lot of their interviews. So, um, so you just need to consider these questions and how you introduce it. And you've got to be smart about that too, uh, because sometimes it needs to be in a good timing, right? You might want to not start with that, the conversation with that. You might want to let people feel a little bit more comfortable after a while of talking, or maybe not even record the first time. Um, so maybe ask if you can take notes or things like that. Um, so it really depends. In terms of training, I don't know that there needs to be a lot of training. However, I would think there needs to be a lot of careful thinking. Uh, people don't, will not spend a whole day on Zoom with you for the most part. You, you maybe want to be open and flexible to allow those things to happen. Conversations with people that maybe you wouldn't even imagine that you would have access to, but now you do on Zoom. If you have a top, so, so when I said be careful and thoughtful, maybe meet with your supervisor, maybe meet with your colleagues and think about how to approach your topic, perhaps a little differently. Now, when I'm doing One Health approach, I've been trying to get on meetings. I usually don't like these webinars. I've been starting to create a network through these webinars and I see, oh, this person, I've never heard of this person. I just uh, met her on Friday, I was in this webinar, um, and suddenly I, uh, I found this vet who sounded really interesting and had this huge critique of One Health, and I was like, okay, can I talk to you later? So I caught her in this webinar, and now I've got that contact, and so I'm going to follow up on that. Now, these are ways that I haven't used before, um, and I think now these digital conferences, digital workshops, allow you to perhaps be exposed to, to people and, and professionals whom you, you might not have been exposed to otherwise. Even in terms of mentorship, so I'm not even talking about your field work, but of, uh, of, of, of who you look up to in your conceptual frameworks. Maybe these people are now like you, sitting in front of computers. Maybe, maybe they'd be open to kind of discussing your ideas as well. This is also something, some, something to think about, not just the field work, but how can you enrich your, uh, your uh, theoretical um, uh, thinking about your topic. This could be an opportunity to do that, to take a pause, to read a book by somebody who you really wanted to read, and then to maybe even talk to that person, you know, ask them questions, communicate that way, create those networks that are so important. Uh, for you as budding anthropologists. So, uh, so that's something else that I'm kind of thinking as we're talking. Thank you so much. I mean, I have also learned a lot from this. So this has been a wonderful conversation. Me too. I didn't know I was thinking about this at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.